Welcome back from the break, everybody. My name is Josh Solomon, uh, and it's my pleasure to be here today uh, and to welcome you all to the second panel of our symposium. Uh, I want to thank you all who are here in the room, uh, as well as those of you who are joining us by live stream. The theme of the second panel is technology, and specifically, how we can optimize technological innovation for health impact and health equity. We have a fantastic roster of panelists uh, to help lead us through this conversation today, uh, which I'd like to set up with just a few brief notes. If we look over the last 100 years, a period that was bookended by two devastating global pandemics, the average global life expectancy has doubled over that period from about 35 years in 1920 to a bit more than 72 years in 2020. And then if we look for the drivers of those big changes in longevity, and we could look at health as well, we of course land on many advances in science and technology translated into improvements in public health and medicine as major contributors to those increases in survival and improvements in health. So that's everything from understanding of germ theory leading to improvements in water and sanitation, development of vaccines, antibiotics, all of these driving major reductions in child mortality over the first part of the last century, to development of effective drug treatments, insulin, antiretroviral therapy, statins, ACE inhibitors, all largely driving gains in adult survival and health over the second half of the century. And of course, those gains have not been shared equally. And that's why uh, we're here today, and that's a major theme for us today. Now, we might look at those historical levels and note that globally, that inequality across countries might have peaked around the middle of the last century. And that was a time when we could see a two and a half fold span uh, between the highest life expectancy in some Nordic countries and the lowest in some parts of West Africa. And perhaps an optimistic note is those, those gaps have narrowed substantially since then. But of course, we still see a world and live in a world marked by persistent, profound, and unacceptably large disparities across nations. Now, as you know, the disparities are not only across nations, but also within. In this country, we find profound inequity that divides along race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, geography. Uh, and we've already heard quite a lot of, uh, of that today. And again, uh, we, don't, we don't need to look any further than uh, the last few years over the COVID-19 pandemic to understand that there's a huge distance between this extraordinary pace of scientific breakthrough, like development of mRNA vaccines for COVID in a record time, and on the other side, the failure to translate those breakthroughs into improvements in health that are timely and equitable. So the goal of the panel today is to try to think together uh, about how we can do more and do better at translating technological innovation into improvements in health, and especially improvements that reduce rather than exacerbating disparities. So if you look at the technological landscape today uh, and, and look across all of the many breakthroughs that we can see already, that we can look forward to, uh, you name it, gene therapy, wearables, uh, AI-driven algorithms for diagnosis and prediction, we want to ask the question, how might we direct all of that innovation towards prioritizing technologies that have the greatest potential to improve health and improve health equity? How can impact and equity be considered and valued prospectively? We've heard a lot about the importance of access and cost, and the third panel today will focus on those. But we're really thinking uh, about how we might incorporate these considerations in the design of new technologies? And what are the policy levers that we might pull to try to push innovation towards a focus on equity? 
Uh, so with that, I'm delighted to introduce our panel members to help us grapple with some of these questions. Uh, as before, I will introduce all three of our panel members and then turn over to them to give us some opening remarks that lead us into a conversation. Uh, you all have been doing an amazing job with the q and I'll just remind you that there is a QR code you can scan or a URL on the screen now. Please enter your questions as they occur to you and they will come to me on the iPad. So without further ado, Dr. Josh Macauer is the Boston Scientific Applied Bioengineering Professor of Medicine and of Bioengineering at the Stanford University Schools of Medicine and Engineering and director and co-founder of the Stanford Byers Center for Biodesign. Dr. Macauer trained in both medicine and mechanical engineering. He's an innovator who holds uh, 300 patents or patent applications for medical devices across a large number of different areas and is founder and executive chairman of ExploraMed, which is a medical device incubator that has created 10 companies over the past 10 years. Welcome. Dr. Sherry Rose is one of my distinguished colleagues in health policy at Stanford and co-director of the Health Policy Data Science Lab. She is a renowned statistician who develops innovative methods in statistics and machine learning to improve health and health equity. Among many recent honors, Dr. Rose has received the Mortimer Spiegelman Award, the nation's highest honor in biostatistics. And just earlier this week, in case you didn't hear, Dr. Rose was awarded with an NIH Director's Pioneer Award. Yes, applause is, is very much merited. So the applause indicates you may know that this is one of the most prestigious and selective grants that NF, NIH confers, only eight of them awarded this year. Uh, and very much looking forward to what Sherry will do under that. Uh, to develop a framework for optimizing social impact of algorithms. Uh, and Dr. Grant Miller, also a distinguished colleague in health policy and a senior fellow at the Freeman's Bogley Institute. Dr. Miller is a health and development economist who focuses on developing more effective health improvement strategies for developing countries. He's a thought leader in the field of global health and his work aims to understand the historical drivers of population health changes. He could do a better job than I just did setting up this conversation. Uh, but also understanding their behavioral underpinnings and especially using these insights to identify strategies and programs that can improve health in populations. So Dr. Macauer, please lead us off. Sure, thank you very much for having me and um, very nice to see everybody. Um, I'll just start off with a little bit of a frame on what uh, Stanford Biodesign is so you can get a sense of what we do and then I'll touch on three initiatives that we're doing that all have a potential to have an impact on health equity. Um, Stanford Biodesign's been uh, at work for about 20 years. Um, we've trained uh, thousands of students, fellows, um, faculty, uh, even executives on a process for innovation, um, a method uh, broken down into simple steps that could allow anyone to be an innovator. And um, many of the big multinationals have incorporated this uh, methodology into their product development process, and our fellows have used, uh, and, and students have used this process to start um, hundreds of companies and, and uh, touched millions of lives with the products that those, um, that those companies have produced. So uh, it's, it's a simple methodology, it's proven, and it all starts with um, identifying needs. And more specifically, identifying needs in the location where they are originated with the stakeholders um, that are involved in those needs and uh, to characterize the different viewpoints of those stakeholders in that environment as a precursor to inventing solutions for them. Um, before I get down to the three initiatives, I'll just mention that, uh, you know, shameless uh, promotion. We have a job spec uh, for a director of health equity and inclusive design. 
uh, to come help us with these three things I'm going to talk about. So if, if, uh, if what we do in, 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 over at Biodesign speaks to you and you have some background in health equity and, and even in uh, innovation, uh, we'd love to, um, love to work with you and have you come help us uh, navigate the future. Um, the three initiatives that we are um, actively engaged in right now that uh, sort of touch on this subject matter um, relate to some of our core beliefs. Um, like I mentioned, um, we really believe that the only way to understand what the problem is is to go live where the, the problem is rather than you know, kind of stay in our protected bubble and, and try to uh, make um, judgments from afar. And one of the ways that we have done this historically over the last 10 years is we've made a major investment in India. Uh, there's an India Biodesign. And we train the faculty there. Uh, then we subsequently help train the uh, group of fellows who, who then have gone on to become faculty and then trained um, hundreds of students across, uh, really, at this point, across the entire country. Um, this has resulted in, similarly, numerous startups, increased investment in the area, uh, jobs, healthcare, economic improvement, and that's brought in big companies and other investors, and it's created this amazing cycle of economic and health vitality around these centers where we have um, invested that energy. And at this point, 10 years later, they're really operating on their own. We do have a continuous uh, uh, relationship and, and continue to support, but at a much lower level. And they really are on their own and doing a fantastic job. And so it's a good model for how an innovation process, if, if you know, sort of the folks in the area where these needs exist are trained, they can actually use that to really uh, improve um, outcomes for the, that population. So now that we've had that experience over the last 10 years, we want to translate this again with our learnings uh, into um, addressing specifically health equity. And so we've identified that we will do two programs uh, across the world, one internationally and one here in the United States, where we will, again, identify a partner institution, train faculty, uh, train fellows, and then in that geography, those individuals uh, will be able to address the needs of that population. And the first one that's sort of getting off to a very good start is our work in East Africa. Um, we have a relationship with the UGHE there, um, and our goal, and that's based in Rwanda, but our goal is to service the entire East African uh, geography with this effort, drawing fellows and students across that, that geography. And they will do, as per our core process, need finding directly in situ and identify these needs. And we will help them with this process of qualifying and, uh, these, these, uh, these needs into a specification that then they will be able to invent solutions to, et cetera hopefully drawing in uh, further investment into those ideas and, uh, and then subsequently, you know, businesses, jobs, et cetera. So that it's a, it's a long-term dedicated effort that we'll be doing over the next several years in East Africa, but it's the beginning of the deployment of this model as a way to address uh, health equity in situ. Um, we'll also be doing one here in the United States, partnered with a historically black college or university and uh, that effort is just beginning in discussions about where we will place that effort here in the United States, but um, very excited about it and uh, just the beginning, but it's, uh, it's one way of empowering the people who are, who are actually seeing these needs firsthand with the tools that they need to be the innovators and actually uh, help solve these problems. So that's initiative number one. The second initiative is really to revisit our process itself. Um, it has obviously been successful uh, in terms of its ability to identify important clinical needs, translating them all the way into commercial businesses which have the potential to improve health, but also be sustaining because they're profitable businesses. Um, but we've also recognized that in all that, we've not sufficiently implanted the appropriate lenses to really make 
those that are coming in in this environment here at Stanford aware of uh, the, let's say, health equity lens, environmental lens, et cetera. And so we're, we, we want to go back, and we are beginning to do this, but we have much more work to do, really to implant the questions and the, and the thought patterns in that process as they're observing needs, not only asking who's being served, but who isn't being served. Uh, not only asking, you know, how have we solved this problem, but if we solve this problem, what are the sort of other effects of solving this problem on other populations who are not in the room? And so those are some of the things that we want to implant into the process to make sure that our next generation of fellows that, and students that we pass through do have a, a thought loop in their minds about more diverse populations and underserved populations who might not necessarily be right in front of them. So that's our second one. Our last initiative is really that we are standing up in collaboration with the Department of Health Policy here and other policy uh, organizations across campus, um, the first innovation policy effort, uh, specifically focused on health technology. And um, here we have, we're, we have uh, an individual, Dr. Kavita Patel, who we're working with to help establish uh, the first program of this regard. Um, and our goal is really to focus on all of the factors that influence um, technology development and innovation as, as it pertains to patient access and health outcomes. And obviously that goes right directly to health equity as well. And it's interesting because many of the policies, and I'll touch on this, yeah, I'm sure we're gonna talk about it, many of the policies that we face as innovators that we have to traverse, uh, obtaining insurance, um, getting FDA approval, um, securing solid patents, uh, getting financing, et cetera, are actually gated by uh, policies in the public and private sector that in, in many ways disadvantage um, uh, populations that are underserved. So um, you know, our mission there is really to address these policies, elevate these issues, uh, and hopefully have policymakers consider uh, alternatives and better, uh, better policies that would uh, serve a broader population in a more equitable way. So I'll pause there and just say thank you and I'll hand it off to Sherry Rose. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, similar to Josh, I'm going to talk about three main areas after giving a bit of a framing. It might end up being four. Um, and just to give a high level overview, uh, many of you are aware that there are a multitude of algorithms new and existing in healthcare. And these advances hold a lot of promise to advance uh, health equity and human health. And when I talk about an algorithm being very general, like it's any um, uh, rule that takes data as an input to uh, return results. And these algorithms can also range in complexity. Sometimes it's a simple checklist in the emergency room asking should we admit this patient to standard regression type procedures where we're trying to predict length of stay in the hospital to the more complex machine learning and AI algorithms where we're trying to um, you know, predict and uh, understand a disease from images and things like that. But the goal is always to yield clinically and policy relevant results uh, so that we can inform decision making and this can span diagnoses, screening, prediction, uh, and beyond. But we also know that, that just as algorithms broadly in society uh, have a negative impact, especially for marginalized groups, this came up earlier today when talking about facial recognition, we've also seen this in mining resume data, in uh, tech companies, these types of issues also happen in healthcare. And we know that there are many groups that are marginalized in the healthcare system, as has been discussed today, and this includes racial and ethnic minorities, disabled individuals, rural communities, and people um, with lower socioeconomic status and those who are uninsured, among others. We know that these groups also experience lower life expectancy and have poor health outcomes. Algorithms specifically could more frequently be contributing to improving health equity rather than harming it. Because in healthcare, we've seen examples where there was racial bias in algorithms, such that black patients would not get the care management they needed. There's also an opioid risk algorithm that surveils all individuals in the United States who pick up prescriptions, and it can lead to the denial of adequate uh, treatment to those who need it most. So how do we combat these issues while bringing innovation together with impact? And this is where I'm gonna share a few ideas I have about this, but it will not be comprehensive. And one key topic that is not flashy at all, this is not gonna be a discussion about AI replacing radiologists, 
Uh, but it's the lack of agreed upon minimum standards in AI and machine learning work, in health and medicine specifically. And we've seen many papers and guidelines published on various aspects of this. I've worked on some of these. I was really delighted to collaborate on a pipeline for ethical machine learning that was led by Irene uh, uh, Chen and Marzia Gassemi. Uh, Judy Gachoya has also, uh, with her colleagues, published a piece on operationalizing fairness. And we talk about algorithmic fairness in healthcare here with thinking about a broad area aiming to identify, understand, and ameliorate societal biases in both data and algorithms. But I believe where we need to go next is the enforcement of minimum standards, and it needs to come from funders and journals and other entities who have actual power in the research and innovation ecosystem. So I was really delighted when our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Bivens Domingo, brought up requirements at journals because uh, I'm on the same page uh, when talking about AI. And we've seen the impact of these types of requirements before. For example, with the pre-registration of primary outcomes for clinical trials, as well as open access mandates from specific funders, such that members of the public and policymakers don't have to spend $34 or $49 to access a single journal article, or they don't have to wait for a year-long embargo period until it's freely available on the uh, NIH websites. So having guidelines that are just suggestions does not lead to change. It does not lead to improve rigor, robustness, fairness, or genuine innovation. Right now, a lot of things that are claimed as innovations are oversold, they're not generalizable, and they do not benefit marginalized groups, and they often harm marginalized groups. So this idea that we need more comprehensive evaluation and consideration of harms can go further. Uh, including questioning the existence of some of the algorithms that we're using. Is this actually an acceptable baseline? That should be one of our first questions. We're not doing a lot of this in healthcare, uh, even after algorithms are deployed, let alone before they are implemented. And so some of the new work that I'm really excited to be leading with the Pioneer Award that Josh mentioned um, is about developing a framework for this, the first framework for understanding the social impact of algorithms before they are deployed, before these harms can occur. And this will involve creating complex causal network models uh, such that we can anticipate and avoid these downstream consequences, especially for marginalized groups. And this is part of the overall high-risk, high-reward portfolio at NIH. I also want to stress that who is doing the research matters. Um, I will be bringing my lived experiences to these projects. I mean, I grew up in a low-income household lacking social support, and um, you know, I was also without health insurance for large periods of my childhood and the entirety of my college experience, I was uninsured. And so I really know what it's like to um, stop taking a prescription because the free clinic had to start charging for it. I know what it's like to, act, uh, to lack access to care, to make decisions about how sick am I, should I go to the emergency room? And uh, I'm creating partnership with empowered leaders in this research uh, from communities that I'm also not part of. And we need more health policy research done by people who have lived through some of its worst gaps. Uh, we ask and answer different questions. Another new area that I'm excited about um, uh, exemplifies another area where I think we need to be innovating, especially with algorithms, and that's in real world implementation in real settings. Uh, so I'm very excited that at Stanford Health Policy, I'm collaborating with Stanford Healthcare uh, with lead Michelle Williams, who's the Executive Director of Patient Care Research and Health Equity, and uh, Stanford Health Policy PhD student Rika Cusick, where we're going to be evaluating both retrospectively and prospectively changes to formulas used in chronic kidney disease care and how these changes impact marginalized and minoritized groups. And some of these changes will include developing algorithms that are tailored specifically towards optimizing fairness. And lastly, I'll close by emphasizing again that we need to be very critical of the data that we're using. Our data encode various biases, and in healthcare we know that our data in include manifestations of structural racism, as well as access to care for many groups. Uh, including those from low income and rural communities and transgender and gender non-conforming individuals. So we need to keep in mind that these biases uh, enter data and algorithms in many different ways, and that detecting this bias can often be hard, especially when we don't uh, collect the data that we need to harken back to the, the prior panel. So I'm really enthusiastic to be working on new projects with the uh, American Board of Family Medicine, the Center for Population Health Sciences here at Stanford, and uh, computer science PhD student Agata Forichars, 
not only about making sure that our data sources capture more of the population, but also about how and whether we can remove societal bias from data before we even try to use algorithms with that data. And I will stop there and uh, pass it to Grant. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. It's, um, it's a real pleasure and honor, seriously, to be uh, on a panel with all three of you. Um, I, um, I have to admit, though, I was watching the previous panel session, and I was watching with great envy as they all use slides, and I would <laughs> love to inflict some slides on all of you, and uh, instead I was forced to note. So um, my loss, maybe it's your gain. Um, uh, the first thing I want to say is, the, as uh, I think maybe the only, but um, we could quibble about that person who works on health primarily in middle and low-income countries, although I think we would, would happily draft all three of you, but it sounds like we may have some, made some headway with at least one, if not two Joshes uh, on the panel, is that um, when we talk about health equity, I think it's important, and something that I really want to fly the flag on, it's important that we not forget about um, global health. Um, and when I say this, I'm talking both about inequality across uh, countries, and I'm talking about inequality within uh, other countries, middle and low income countries. So to contextualize a little bit, uh, in the United States, uh, the life expectancy gap between the top 1% and the bottom 1% of the income distribution is about 15 years for men, it's about 10 years for women. Um, most other comparisons you could make within the US population would sort of fall within those ranges. If we look across countries, the life expectancy at birth gap is as large as 30 years. Uh, many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have life expectancy that falls more than 20 years behind the highest income countries in the world. And this is after 40 plus years of convergence in population health across countries of the world. So enormous gaps across countries still remain. Um, there are much bigger uh, data challenges to make similar comparisons within other low-income countries. And so I'll just say that I think it's clear that there is even greater uh, gaps that exist within some middle and low-income countries within the US. So, um, so these are important to keep in the conversation too, is my first point. So I'm not a technologist. I do work on uh, behavior and social science, as Josh mentioned. I'm going to try to talk about technology anyway. I certainly worry about the adoption of technologies. Um, so the second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to distinguish, if I can, what I guess I would term the intrinsic properties of technologies to increase or decrease uh, health equity from uh, the distribution of technologies. So both are really important, both combine to ultimately influence the impact that a technology has on uh, health equality, but I do think it's useful for the conversation to distinguish them. So um, starting with the intrinsic properties, uh, I'd suggest that no technology is inherently neutral. Um, so based on cost and types of health conditions that they address, uh, many health technologies are often adopted first by uh, the elite of society. So I'm going to call these regressive technologies. And so naturally then they increase in equality, at least at the outset when they're introduced. Um, my perspective is that's not inherently problematic. Um, it sort of parallels a very old debate that exists about economic growth and the concern that economic growth can increase economic uh, inequality. We certainly, I wouldn't think, would suggest that economic growth is bad. But what it means is we then have to really take very seriously as society distribution plans in light of the forces set in play by the intrinsic qualities of the, of the property. Um, then there are other technologies that, uh, based on their intrinsic properties, actually reduce health inequality from the outset. Um, and so I'm going to call these progressive technologies. And based on cost and types of diseases that they address, I think there are a lot of examples here. One, Josh and I were talking about, uh, the first Josh, that is right before the panel, is uh, oral rehydration therapy. Um, there are lots of others, even some that you may not put in this progressive category. So I would put, for example, uh, penicillin and sulfa drugs uh, introduced uh, mid 20th century. So I've done some work with some people here at Stanford uh, and elsewhere that shows that there were powerful convergent forces in population health 
uh, that accompanied the introduction of penicillin and sulfa drugs. Um, and this is because they're dramatically cheaper than something like sanitary infrastructure, which is very inequitably distributed around the world and historically a big source of health inequality as well. Um, and so for these progressive technologies, uh, I'm gonna talk in a minute about the development of them, but we do have people, I'm excited to say here at Stanford, working very hard to develop them. So you heard about the India Biodesign Program, and there are others for those of you that are interested in uh, looking them up, like uh, the Program on Entrepreneurial Design for Extreme Affordability, joint between the business school and the school of design. Okay, so these are intrinsic properties of technologies. I'm, I'm clearly instructed, just like I was clearly instructed not to use slides, not to talk about distribution, but I will say that distribution, a distribution plan can, I'll talk to you later about this, Josh, um, <laughs> can strongly and does strongly moderate the effect of a health technology on health equity and that even intrinsically regressive health technologies can have a positive impact on health equity um, because of their distribution plan. And so an example here, I think clearly in my mind, would be something like PEPFAR and the distribution of antiretroviral drugs across sub-Saharan Africa, uh, say, over the first decade of, of this century. Okay, so we have regressive and progressive health technologies. The next topic I wanted to touch on is what leads a society to develop these technologies? Um, what is a society incentivized to develop um, in the first place? So uh, obviously market forces play a huge role. Um, and naturally, market forces will draw innovation to focus uh, on the health needs of the wealthy and of wealthy countries. To the extent that the needs of the wealthy and the poor differ, this is then an obvious source of uh, inequality. It produces very strong market incentives for the creation of uh, intrinsically regressive technologies. Again, just as I mentioned with the example of economic growth, I don't think this is inherently bad. It just means we need to take distribution then very seriously for these technologies. Well, what about the incentives to develop intrinsically progressive technologies? So um, efforts to develop progressive technologies uh, have historically been dominated by the public sector and by uh, major philanthropy. Um, but the incentives for success are a lot weaker because there's not the same market reward. Uh, there's been a lot of progress uh, in the past 10, 15 years to try to harness and strengthen market incentives to develop progressive technologies. So an example I would point out here uh, are advanced purchase commitments or advanced market commitments. So if you're not familiar with them, um, these are mechanisms that ex ante guarantee a certain market financial reward for innovators uh, who successfully make a new technology that meets uh, certain pre-specified criteria. So it really creates stronger market incentives for the development of progressive technologies that intrinsically have the ability to reduce um, health inequity. Um, if you're familiar with Gavi, Gavi has administered an advanced market commitment uh, in the past 10 years that's brought the world three new uh, pneumococcal vaccines that have already been given to hundreds of millions of people around the world that wouldn't have existed. Um, final point here uh, that I just want to mention is that this distinction I'm setting up is becoming blurred over time uh, with the rise of non-communicable diseases in low-income countries. The health needs of rich and poor countries are getting mixed, and I would suggest that in this balance of effort on development and uh, distribution, it may tilt a bit the, the, the need a bit more towards uh, emphasis on distribution going forward. Um, okay, so finally, I'd like to touch briefly on the issue of how anticipation of distribution uh, might or should inform uh, or guide innovation that's concerned with health equity. Um, so anticipation of distribution, a real, I'm talking about distribution anyway, Josh, um, a, a real champion in my book uh, on the distribution side in global health is someone named Jim Grant, uh, who was executive director of UNICEF during the 1980s, sort of was a leader of what's often referred to as the child survival revolution. And he invested very heavily and led a movement that invested very heavily on mass distribution of 
progressive health technologies for really, um, growth monitoring, oral rehydration therapy, breastfeeding, and immunizations. And this era, the 1980s in fact, is the era that you saw epibundle vaccine coverage among kids around the world rise in many lower income countries from 30, 40%, to 80% or even more. Enormous progress uh, just based on distribution. A lot of enthusiasm out there for distribution. I've already been plugging it as well as making jokes about it. Um, uh, but I would say that um, there may not be quite as much low hanging fruit purely uh, on distribution as some people may believe. And the reason I'd argue is because distribution has to fundamentally grab with the fact that uh, intrinsically progressive technologies often face a limitation that they require some behavior change. Uh, for their benefits to be realized. And changing behavior is very, very hard. It's notoriously hard. We have many uh, progressive technologies today uh, whose benefits are not nearly uh, realized uh, in low-income countries because of the behavior change required. Insecticide-treated bed nets, point-of-use drinking water disinfectants, uh, cleaner burning, improved cook stoves. I could tell you stories about these, and I know others can too. Um, so given the challenges of changing behavior, what I really want to say is that I think a real sweet spot for innovation that is concerned with health equity uh, to focus is the intersection of these progressive technologies, but progressive technologies that also require little or even no behavior change. Not always possible, but sometimes it is. What's an example of a progressive technology that requires little or no behavior change? Um, a big one, uh, I would suggest, is uh, micronutrient fortification. Um, so uh, if you fortify foods that people are choosing to eat anyway, making their own choices given the circumstances that they face, and you make it much healthier, you deliver micronutrients that they're lacking, you're not asking them to eat differently, with, which often people can't or can't afford to do. You're not trying to blanket the world with vitamin supplements all over the place. You're working with the choices that people are already making for themselves and you're improving their health and you can do it at scale. Uh, anemia alone, there are almost two billion people still in the world today that are anemic. Uh, the primary cause is iron deficiency anemia. Um, in India, a place where I work, half of pregnant women, two thirds of kids under five are anemic. Important risk factor for maternal mortality leads to cognitive stunting uh, and cognitive harm which lasts throughout the life course among kids who are anemic. Um, I spent a good five years of my life up until COVID working with one state government in India, the government of Tamil Nadu, to introduce uh, fortified foods and fortified rice into the state's public distribution system. Very sadly, it went down uh, over uh, the bureaucratic response to the COVID pandemic. Um, and I learned way more about rice than I ever thought I would and probably ever really want to. Uh, and I'm not gonna sit here and tell you about rice and I recommend if you're staying for dinner and we have rice, you not sit next to me. Um, we don't eat it in my house anymore. But I will say that even something as simple as a fortified food or a fortified rice kernel could still benefit enormously from further innovation. And this is an innovation that already exists. Um, I hope the final panel, uh, wherever you are, that's, that is talking about distribution is gonna talk a little bit about political economy after this work in Tamil Nadu went down. Prime Minister Modi announced a, a plan to fortify foods, staple foods provided uh, across all of India through the public distribution system. And my team and I were invited to collaborate with the national government on this, which we started until we learned that identifying concerns with uh, how the program was proceeding was not okay. And we learned that any scholarship suggesting that the benefits weren't less than spectacular as part of the political narrative weren't okay. So we sadly disengaged uh, because we didn't feel like we had that much to contribute. Doesn't dampen my enthusiasm for the technology. So um, I'm just gonna conclude by underscoring the fact that I do believe that innovation can be a powerful force for health equity. I believe that there is a, a sweet spot at the intersection of progressivity and low behavior change. And I do believe that we have seen uh, that we can strongly incentivize the development of uh, progressive technologies in ways that haven't happened uh, in the past on their own. Thanks. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. 
so much there, a wonderful start to the conversation. I, I want to pick up um, in some ways where, where Grant left off, um, thinking about where we start and how we start. Uh, I mean, make no mistake, I, I think if, if the goal is to really pivot the innovation engine toward equity, it's a massive goal, right? It requires uh, system change uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, and you know, I think it was very inspiring to hear Dr. Bibbins Domingo today taking on a big problem and you know, landing on here are the concrete steps that we're gonna start with. Uh, so I'm wondering if we could spend a few minutes just kind of talking about what you see as the pathway towards uh, you know, what I would say is, is a big change uh, in a lot of systems. Are there any low-hanging fruit that we could start with uh, in some of the areas that you mentioned, regulation or or, or Sherry was talking about uh, standards um, for, for algorithms. Uh, what do you see as the, 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 the big pathway? What do you see as the first steps along that pathway? Uh, what do you see as the, the biggest obstacles to, to try to tilt at right away? And I think I'll just go down the line. I, I, I think, Grant, you, you sort of started on this, but um, when we get to you, I'll invite you to, to add it as you like. Can you start with Josh? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I think that it starts with appreciating that um, you know, lower income regions and countries actually can teach us something about how to, uh, how to do um, healthcare at a scale and at a cost that's lower. Um, so I think this idea of you know, focusing on those communities and understanding them, um, embedding so much you know, immersing in them as a, uh, as, and in fact, taking the opportunity to recognize the innovators in those settings is probably the beginning of, uh, of, a, of a process towards answering some of those goals. So, um, you know, that's, that's fundamental to how we, how we would um, approach our need finding process. And, you know, it's really with identifying um, identifying those needs. Um, and they are different. Uh, they're different from one country to the next and one region to the next. And uh, there may be commonalities, but I think you know, we might run into some challenges trying to generalize uh, across a, a wide population and, and even just even a one income bracket across different uh, cultures. Um, so it, it probably starts there. Uh, speaking to minimum standards, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there, even though it's been very difficult to get buy-in. I've been talking about this for years, and um, we, we're still not there yet. But uh, one of the things that we could do is, is, you know, this may involve additional review criteria and processes for ethics. So this has been proposed and implemented elsewhere, including at some computer science conferences, although they don't have minimum evaluation standards. Um, but it really could involve new ethics-centered board members at journals and staff at granting agencies and uh, ethics reviewers at both. And we, what we really need this to lead to is that minimum standard to require ethics, fairness, and health equity uh, considerations for AI tools overall, that a tool is only robust if it has been assessed for influencing or exacerbating harms to minoritized groups. So... I agree with all of this when I think about the context of middle and low income countries. So I talked about advanced market commitments. That takes money. Um, another way of calling that is a pull mechanism. Um, pull mechanisms are not a panacea. Uh, you have to be able to visualize exactly what product you want that doesn't exist to specify it for it to work. Um, there's enormous potential for innovation of things that we are not imagining right now. Um, and so how do we encourage that? Um, uh, well, I think that the, I'm a big believer personally, even though I'm not a technologist, I'm a groupie of technologists. Um, I, I'm a big believer in uh, the design uh, process, the design thinking process that Josh has described. I do think in something that I really wanna um, congratulate the biodesign program for uh, identifying is the importance of trying to train uh, innovators um, from communities uh, where technologies might actually be used. 
Um, there are so many things that have been developed that seem like great ideas by knuckleheads like me that don't really know. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of funny examples. There's something called the life straw. I don't know if you've ever heard of the life straw. Life straw, it's something that you can take any sort of foul water and drink it through this straw and it'll be purified by the time it comes out the other end so you get safe water from dirty drinking water, right? Could be a, a game changer. Um, why is a life straw not the game changer that it could be? Well, one reason at least is it turns out people don't like to put their face right up in a dirty, foul source of water <laughs> when they're gonna take a drink, even though they know this straw exists. Um, uh, there are other, sadly, uh, examples. There are many, many. You probably have your own favorite. Um, uh, an infant warmer that looks like a sleeping bag that you can slip a, a premium in, uh, and maintain constant body temperature in an environment without uh, NICU. Well, if that uh, clashes with uh, the provision of or the belief in uh, kangaroo uh, maternal care, then already you have a conflict that could have been anticipated through better design process. So the design process is important. We need to train innovators from places that will really understand and not make these uh, dummy mistakes is uh, a big, big feeling of mine. And I'm gonna say one other thing, which is going back to financial incentives and this push versus pull mechanism issue, I think you could create financial incentives at intermediate steps in the innovation process that wouldn't just require producing a pneumococcal vaccine that meets certain parameters when it's all done. You can sort of help them uh, come along uh, in a more effective way with financial incentives. If I could just you know, build upon those comments, um, most recently I was just uh, at a recent uh, uh, Stanford event introduced to um, Jeff Tabin, who's um, who's created this Himalayan cataract project, um, which is a unbelievable and exciting story, and it also reveals how innovation can happen uh, in an environment that is incredibly low resourced. But it it also reveals all of the elements of our regulatory and other financial incentives within our process that prevent some of these things from happening. And I think just to tell that story, probably not nearly as well as, as he did, he's also climbed Everest on a side of Everest that no one else has climbed, so he's quite a remarkable person. Um, but um, what I was amazed at is uh, he discovered that many people in um, Nepal were um, going blind and because of glaucoma, essentially, um, something that is easily treated here uh, in the United States. Um, but there, it's a death sentence. And in fact, it cripples uh, families and, it, and really, um, you know, it has a long tail because if your, your parent um, or an elder person in your family has this, you're basically constrained to being their, ter their caregiver. And so even the livelihoods of the young people in that family would essentially be limited and it has a huge economic and health impact. And so him, him being an ophthalmologist and understanding this, looked at, well, why isn't this happening? Of course, the technology, you know, these lenses that are available for replacement and the surgery itself is, uh, is very expensive. Um, but it doesn't have to be. It's actually a simple material. But we've, we have, you know, because of our processes here in the United States, covered this thing in all sorts of bureaucracy. Uh, the cost of developing new technology, um, the cost of distributing that technology, the cost of getting it insured, uh, you know, selling it, advancing. Um, it's, it's just a tremendous, tremendous cost. And therefore, uh, it makes it impossible to imagine how you do all that and then ultimately uh, deliver it to a population at some reasonable price. Um, what he did is he went back and re-engineered um, the entire process. Of course, had the benefit of an existing technology that had already been proven, but completely established a new manufacturing facility in Nepal and then, um, and then a, a, a capability and a framework for being able to implant these uh, devices and, and diagnose people, and he's transformed, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives in Nepal. So it is possible to do, um, but it does reveal the limitations that we have within our own system that have just burdened uh, the process of innovation with 
an exceptional amount of expense that we as you know, consumers of healthcare wind up paying. And unfortunately, it does separate out uh, populations of those with insurance and those without and, um, and the type of insurance that those individuals have. Thanks. I wanted to um, take some questions from the audience. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Rose. How do you think about effectiveness equity trade-offs in algorithms? For example, suppose algorithm A increases life expectancy by five years on average, but leaves inequalities or inequities unchanged. Algorithm B reduces inequities, some, but increases life expectancy by only three years on average. I think this is where there's, uh, it's incredibly important for us to actually think about how we're optimizing these algorithms, because that would be maybe secret choice C, which was when we're optimizing, we can build fairness constraints directly into that optimization problem, and then we might be able to yield uh, better results. Because as I said before, I strongly believe that it's, it's, it's not, um, we, we don't want to have algorithms that are perpetuating um, these, these health disparities. Yeah, so, so I think, you know, I'm hearing a theme, it's very consistent uh, across all three of you about the importance of centering equity in, as part of the design process, as an explicit design criterion. I think it applies to algorithms, it applies to, uh, to uh, what we think of as traditional devices and technology. Uh, a question for Grant. Um, in your experience, what is the ideal role that an American researcher would have in translating their global health research in a country that's not their own? Sorry, the last part I didn't... In a, in a country that's not their own. Oh, uh, it's something that you approach with great humility and with strong collaboration and partner. You don't come in as... Um, as uh, the big boss or the PI or something like this. You build collaborations. Presumably, you've built them before you even begin working on something uh, rather than the other way around, although unfortunately, it doesn't happen that way. And, um, and everything proceeds as an equal partner from there. And I think it's happening more. It's not happening enough. Um, but I'd say relative to 20 years ago, there have actually been some, a number of positive developments on that front. Can I, can I echo that Please. statement as in the context of algorithms? I think this is incredibly crucial when developing algorithms that are focused on health equity. There's way too much work in statistics and computer science and machine learning where technical researchers are parachuting into an area. Mm -hmm. um, they're not engaged with the application. They're not engaged with the community. And they think that they can just solve it, drop a paper, and leave, and get their paper awards and all that. And um, we absolutely need to be better than that. We need to not not reward that kind of work as much. Um, so a, a question for Josh, uh, and this picks up on a point um, where in a way you ended up a, a minute or two ago. How do you balance the high markup that new biomedical technologies need, ask for R&D, uh, and the equitable distribution of these to populations that have the greatest need and least access? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a systemic issue. Um, and we can, uh, you know, some of this uh, idea of sort of um, a guaranteed advanced payment is some way of offsetting some of the financial risk. You know, the challenge that, that we have is to innovate and do something completely revolutionary that advances health usually comes with a number of questions and risks. And, um, you know, we've built a system in um, you know, the Food and Drug Administration, and then after that, um, ga gates on access associated with insurance and Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, that are quite expensive to navigate. Um, I, you know, I can, you know, we, just as an example, I was in a board meeting uh, just yesterday, uh, technology for addressing um, the opioid crisis uh, with an alternative methodology for pain relief. And um, I mean, we're, we're facing all sorts of interesting, obscure questions coming from the Food and Drug Administration that are purely um, theoretical and will cost tens of millions to answer and probably years of delay 
um, in getting patients access. Um, the investors in the company have to foot the bill for that. And in response to that, they're expecting a return. So, you know, the, the more costly the process is, the more delays there are, the more expensive the ultimate outcome is. And unfortunately, the, the pricing on the other side is, is equivalently large. Um, this is the equation that we're constantly dealing with. And so I think we need to take a, uh, a balanced approach um, and look at trying to get to some r rational basis for um, some of these systems. Obviously, we need a, a strong and, and, and healthy FDA. Um, and of course, we have a limited resources and insurance can only pay for so many things. But on the other hand, the current system does seem more about, um, you know, sort of protecting the administrators of much of the public health system, which is private and private companies, private insurance companies, um, who are primarily interested in um, making sure that they can maintain their business. So we, we have some systemic issues here in the United States, even if you just look here. Um, externally, you know, these things, the, these exact types of policies are also limiting access and, and improving the dispar and, or increasing the disparities in health equity. So I think we need to, to look at those, understand their broader impact, and as a society, make some judgments about where the right setting is. And if we can dial it back, put it in the, into uh, some more balance, I think we'll probably wind up um, being able to improve health equity as well. May I, may I add on that quickly? So very quickly, uh, whoever asked that question uh, clearly is interested in economics. Uh, <laughs> static efficiency, dynamic efficiency. Um, it is clear that a large market reward, high prices, uh, strengthens innovation. And so the classic tension that was identified is if you want to distribute something equi equitably, you need to distribute it at low cost. But if, you, uh, if the innovator is only getting compensated at the low cost, then that destroys the incentives for innovation. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Someone has to pay. And so if the idea is someone pays the high price and then users get it at the low price, someone has to pay the differential. Governments, international organizations, who's ever concerned about it, it, um, it has to be paid. Um, there has to be that commitment. All right. I, I'll say the audience has done a wonderful job anticipating where the speakers are going and, and asking very astute questions. I'm going to put this out there. It, it's the theme that we've been touching on. So I'll, I'll ask if there's anything to add um, when the question is posed this way, uh, very much uh, aligned with what we've been talking about the last few minutes. But for the investor community in Silicon Valley, especially in the current explosion of biotech startups, how might we build a better business case for health equity? Um, and I'm happy to go down the line if you all want to um, comment on that. Yep. I'll just start by saying that, there, that we've already seen how incentives create and drive behavior. Uh, the, the example I like to use is the orphan disease um, legislation that completely transformed the biotech industry focus them on orphan diseases, and thus a flow of um, new products came for these, these diseases that were getting no attention whatsoever. Um, now, one could debate, you know, the, you know, the pricing of some of those are exorbitant and inappropriate. However, it, it, it actually drove the entire innovation ecosystem and overall lowered the cost and availability or increased the availability of these technologies, which ultimately resulted in you know, the availability for us to sort of design a COVID vaccine in a weekend. So there's, there is some possible benefit of setting policies that create fiscal incentives to drive these behaviors, and you'll find investors going into those. Um, and on the big, the big scheme of things, I think the net impact for the overall distribution and health more broadly has, been, has benefited from that, um, yet also creating an incentive for a smaller group to be served um, and, you know, let's say handsomely rewarded. So there, you know, I, I acknowledge that there's some disequity with respect to that, but overall that incent, that policy actually has driven better health care for, for many more people than, um, than just orphan disease uh, subjects. 
I don't, I don't know if I'm the best person to ask about the business incentives. Um, I, I, I'll keep it short. Um, I, I really just feel this is an ethical and moral imperative. And, uh, but it will lead to decrease, uh, decreases in healthcare costs and improvements in health outcomes. And those are things that everybody wants. So Sherry, you're an economist on top of it all. <laughs> so the, so I would just decision quickly... scientist, just to be clear. Statistician. <laughs> nice try, Josh. Um, <laughs> So there is evidence that healthier workers are more productive. And so the productivity gains can benefit the business that makes the investment in the worker health. I think actually the challenge, though, from the perspective of an individual employer uh, in a large population is that it's always going to be easier to try to select healthy workers than it is to improve the health of your workers. And so how you protect against you know, selecting versus uh, and, and, and really, you know, force people that care about a healthy uh, workforce of their own to invest in it, um, probably it's through regulation in um, higher income countries. There are some environments where regulatory structures don't work so well, and I think that's a much harder mm -hmm. challenge. Great. So Ben is signaling time. I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to give us one last minute because I want to end on a high note. Um, so one of the audience members asked the same question that I wanted to end on, which is, lightning answer, uh, what gives you cause for optimism that we really can um, channel health innovation for equity? I'll just briefly say our fellows and students give me tremendous optimism. Um, they are teaching us uh, about that health equity, and we have a lot to learn and they are driving the way. And so I'm very encouraged by our trainees and uh, what they're interested in uh, taking their lives, dedicating their lives to solving. Uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that there are now more resources going towards health equity research. But again, we need to make sure that those resources go to those who have been engaged in this for years and decades. The fact that major challenges remain shouldn't uh, overshadow the fact that in the past 50 years there's been enormous population health convergence occurring. And if you believe the past predicts the future, it doesn't mean take your eye off the ball, but things have been moving in a good direction. Well, fantastic. Uh, please, everybody, join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>